There was an escape from the off-world colonies two weeks ago. Five replicants specialize in anamorphic. Hey, Adek. Brian. I knew you would be back if the scope took to one. So you want to shoot anamorphic yourself? Well, sit down. We have a lot of interesting stuff waiting for you. In this episode we are going to explore anamorphic shooting. We are evaluating pros and cons of anamorphic adapters, projector lenses and full-blown anamorphic lenses. We're going to test these, putting them in a real-life torture chamber for lenses. And of course, we're going to pitch them straight against each other. Our goal is to give you a good idea on what is possible and what price range, what is to be expected from a practical perspective and what image can make your heart sing. For even more anamorphic insights, we're going to talk to Forrest and Dan from Atlas, who made professional anamorphic a whole lot more affordable for everybody with the Orion series of lenses. Here you can enjoy some exclusive footage shot on the brand new Silver Edition Orion lenses. They also gave us the chance to show you how far we came with the direct comparison between the lenses that started at all, the Bausch & Lomb Cinema Scope lenses, and modern Atlas and Orion lenses. We're going to talk to DIY legend Chito Fajadans, and if you think anamorphic is only great for filming, let us introduce you to Dick Sweeney and his amazing anamorphic photography. We give you tips for creative use you might not have considered, as well as the do's and don'ts of anamorphic lenses. We will also give you some previews for Scope Chapter 3 that will be all about modding, bokeh and flare design, and those devilish details. For those that desire more in-depth to their understanding of anamorphic, we strongly recommend that you watch Scope Chapter 1 first. We show you the different flavors of widescreen cinema, from Cinerama over Cinemascope to 70mm and Techniscope. We show you why anamorphic fell out of Hollywood's favor and why it made it back. We explain to you the physics behind anamorphic lenses and what makes the image so different to normal spherical lenses. What problems come with the process, practically and optically, we explore principles, different lens designs, the fashion of anamorphic throughout cinema's history, and while we're at it, we give a cocky Blade Runner what he's been asking for. It was quit when I come in here, Brian. Anamorphic is a complex subject and it requires specific know-how, so it's not for quitters. I'm twice as quit now. Stop right where you are. You know the score, pal. If you don't shoot anamorphic, you're little filmmaker. No choice, huh? No choice, pal. This is Scope, Chapter 2. escape from the off-world colonies two weeks ago. Five replicants specialize in anamorphic. I'd hold and go over to the studio and run my counter test on the new crew members. Looks like he got himself one. You might think so, but it absolutely does make a difference. That's Nicholas, Nexus 6, basic pleasure mod. The standard item for YouTube channels. Talk about Beauty and the Beast. He's neither. What's this? That's Forrest. Trained for an off-world lens design squad. Optimum optical efficiency. That's then Keynes. Anamorphic specialist designed for product innovations. He cannot be stopped. They're going to talk about the past, present and future of anamorphic in the industry. And about their personal journeys. 
The next skin job is Cheeto, probably the DIY expert. He can review anamorphic lenses all day and night. The only way to hurt him is to make him shoot spherical. Every anamorphic adapter projector lens you ever heard of. He probably made a video about it already. He also has amazing DIY tips. Which is what? Ever tried to build your own split diopters? We will refer to Cheeto in his videos throughout this episode. The fifth skin job is Dick Sweeney, trained for a kick photo shoot, photography and anamorphic. He does both. There are endless possibilities combining different style projector lenses or adapters with lenses combining their characteristics for an always changing image. It's just like constructing your own racing machine. And if the machine doesn't work? It is certainly not practical and nothing you really want to use on a high-end project. But the brave can really play around and develop their very own magic sauce. Being in love with anamorphic has always been an expensive affair. Anamorphic lenses are way more complex and the market for them has always been tiny compared to their spherical counterparts. Historically, lenses to shoot anamorphic have been built and designed for rental market only. Companies like Panavision produce their lenses exclusive for their in-house rental service. Officially, you can't even buy a new Panavision lens. Other companies that are popular for their anamorphic glass, like Vantages for their Hawks, only sell to rentals and are quite picky on that matter. And those companies that sell to the public, like Zeiss and Cook, well, the price for a complete set can quickly exceed that of a house. The anamorphic market used to be an exclusive club for the top dogs, and a good portion of it remains just that. Thankfully, the digital era liberated parts of the industry and made a lot of things more accessible. And also, there has been a growing community of people that use DIY solutions. The solutions we are going to look at will range from about $250 all the way up to $15,000 for a single cine lens. As said in the intro, our goal is to give you a good idea on what is possible at what price point, what is to be expected from a practical perspective, and what image can make your heart sing. At the end of this episode, you should be able to decide whether you build your lens yourself, you rent something for a specific project, or if you become an owner-operator with the option to rent your gear to others. As always, there's no right or wrong. It all depends on what you try to achieve. We actually wrote to Panavision, Vantage, Cook and to Zeiss to ask if they would like to show us how much better the lenses are compared to the more budget-friendly options that we will test today. Well, only Zeiss answered and didn't choose to participate in the end. We even tried to rent Vantage Hawks through the Marmalade, the production company who so kind to help us on this and other episodes. And if you know anything about the Marmalade, the top dogs on the global stage, guess what? We still got a brush off. I have to admit, I get it. If you talk to Nolan, Tarantino, Heutema, why would they talk to us and therefore to you? They have very little to gain here, but potentially something to lose. The myth that lies at the bottom of some brands is clearly better preserved if we don't, well, demystify them. Or maybe they just think that we are the skin jobs of the medium. Anyways, we will not be able to show you how much absolutely breathtakingly, uniquely, awesomely better the lenses look or work when compared to something that mere models can rent or own. If you are going to shoot anamorphic, you will either use a dedicated anamorphic lens an anamorphic adapter that is designed to add a squeeze factor to a spherical lens or a projector attachment, so a lens that was designed to project anamorphic movies. That works quite similar to adapters, but it's quite quirky as these attachments have not been designed for the purpose of filming with them. We are going to test a variety of different lenses from each of these categories and pitch them directly against each other. Before we go into the test, it makes sense to answer some simple questions. What sensor format, aspect ratio and resolution is the best to shoot anamorphic? 
As always, there's not one definitive answer to that question and it depends on the given lens, camera and most of all, on the desired result. There's little conformity to be expected when talking about anamorphic, starting with the different squeeze factors. If you want to know what squeeze factors exist and why, we suggest you revisit Scope Chapter 1. There are many different aspect ratios and all of them can be used with any anamorphic stretch factor by cropping. Some aspect ratios are connected to specific stretch factors. The most common desired aspect ratio is 2.39 to 1 for classic widescreen. There have been slightly different ones like 2.55 to 1 in the early 60s that have been used in modern times for nostalgic reasons like in La La Land. Still, the most important aspect ratio is 2.39 to 1, sometimes expressed as 2.4 to 1. If you want to go wider or taller, go for it, but know why you do it. This aspect ratio is the result of using a 4 perforation 35mm film with a soundtrack, stretched to twice its width using a 2x anamorphic lens. If you translate 2.39 to 1 to an aspect without anamorphic squeeze, so simply divide the width by 2, that is 1.2 to 1. Translated to video taxonomy that only uses full numbers, that is 6 to 5. So, shooting 6 to 5 will give you a native 2.39 to 1 aspect ratio when using a 2x anamorphic lens. A good rule of thumb is to use a 6x5 crop with a maximum height given the sensor format and the available shooting modes. Of course, shooting a slightly wider aspect like 4x3 or a larger crop like in the case of Alexa OpenGate can be helpful if cropping in the post is desired. Be aware that most anamorphic lenses vignette and or distort severely outside of the format they were designed for. The wider, the worse. Anamorphic is by no means bound to this aspect ratio and Netflix for example prefers a 2 by one aspect ratio. This can be achieved by using a different anamorphic stretch factor, which will change the look, or by simply cropping the anamorphic image, reducing the utilized sensor real estate and therefore the resolution. You can use this formula to calculate any native aspect ratio for any given process. Sensor crop aspects width, W, divided by its height, H, multiplied by the anamorphic stretch factor, A, to 1. For example, 6x5 with a 2x anamorphic squeeze would be 6x5 equals 1.2 times 2 is 2.4 to 1. The astigmatism inherent to an anamorphic process gives the image a softness that makes resolutions, or the loss of resolution through cropping, much less important compared to a spherical process. Generally, you should shoot with the most resolution available given your camera and lens but not worry too much about the lack of resolution. No matter what resolution you throw on it, the lens has more impact on limiting the perceived detail than the resolution provided by the sensor. If you desire a real 4K release, and Netflix can be quite anal about that in their own productions, does 4K refer to the material after the disc squeeze or before? The anamorphic process doesn't really add resolution in a physical sense. It is an optical upscale on just one axis. So it should be the resolution of the sensor crop, right? Here is a scene of Netflix's own U that was shot on 2x Tot AO35 lenses on an Alexa LF and it is released in 2x1. If the full open gate height of the sensor is used, the 1x1 crop that will result in a 2x1 will have an effective horizontal resolution of 3096 pixels far off 4K, but more than that of an Alexa Mini that would yield 2202 pixels for a 1x1 one one crop. So for Netflix, it seems like it's the de-squeezed resolution of the footage that determines 4K. I'm quite amazed that the Todd I.O. design for 35mm covered the Alexa LF 1x1 one one crop. Maybe they used an extender, I don't know. Look how hard and quickly the sharpness decreases off-center. Everything that is not right within this area is just mush. The most amazing thing was that I didn't even notice that when I actually watched you the first time. And that should put my previous statement in perspective. 
Generally, you can use any sensor size to shoot anamorphic, depending on the lens or setup that you use. But anamorphic benefits from a tall native aspect ratio, as more sensor real estate can be used, depending on the squeeze factor and the desired end format. When we are looking at 2x anamorphic for classic cinemascope aspect, different sensor sizes utilize different crop sizes. As the width is flexible, effective sensor size is usually described by the usable height. Normal full-frame sensors have a relatively high aspect ratio of 3 by 2. Vista Vision and LF being just cinematic terms for what is known in photography as full-frame. This will allow for 24mm height if the camera offers to record the full sensor, often referred to as open gate or has a 6x5 mode, utilizing the full sensor height. The Alexa LF sensor is slightly larger, but not in a meaningful way, offering 25.5mm. The Red Monstro sensor is a bit wider than full frame, but not as high, with 21.6mm. The Alexa with a 4x3 sensor allows for a 4 perforation height Super 35mm crop with 80mm height which is pretty much identical to the size of film. Cinecams that don't have a full-frame sensors are usually declared as Super 35 or DCI aspect sensors. That means that they have a wider native aspect ratio, something around 1.9 to 1. With these wider formats, you have to use a relatively small crop, making cameras with these kind of sensors a less ideal choice. All RED cameras, the Canon C lineup except for the C500 and C700, all Vericams and all Blackmagic design cameras larger than Micro Four Thirds have a wide sensor aspect ratio. If you crop these sensors to 6x5, you lose a lot of sensor real estate and use a height of around 40mm, making them almost as small as Micro Four Thirds. As the name implies, it has a native 4x3 aspect ratio and lets you utilize most of the sensor state for CinemaScope. If the camera offers anamorphic or open gate modes, you can have heights of around 30mm. The Blackmagic Pocket 4K utilizes 19x10mm of the sensor state. The usable 6x5 crop is therefore significantly smaller than that of Micro Four Thirds. It will give you 10mm sensor height. While you can always use anything to shoot anamorphic, you can see that a Pocket 4K wouldn't be an ideal companion for an anamorphic cine lens unless you use a focal reducer. It can be great to use with baby scopes. Most modern full-frame mirrorless cameras are quite good companions for anamorphic shooters if the camera offers open gate or anamorphic modes and decent codecs. Many full-frame cameras only support 16x9 when in video mode, limiting the recorded sensor height like for example, the Sony A7 series can utilize a maximum sensor height of 20mm in video mode, while a Panasonic S1H has an open gate mode that allows for 24mm height. You should also keep an eye on rolling shutter, if your camera has a rolling shutter that is. If the sensor image is stretched out horizontally, the effects of a slow rolling shutter is enhanced. If your setup suffers from these effects, choose a camera movement that doesn't cause rolling shutter artifacts. We will talk a lot more about taking lenses, varidiopters, rigging and so on after the main test. But we thought that it's more interesting to you to see some results before we go all the way down the rabbit hole. I don't work here anymore. Of course, the best way to test a lens is to put your camera on a tripod, filming a chart and a model with some techy light chains in the background and then having someone shine a flashlight into the lens. This will just show you about everything you need to know. And it's just so boring. So we will not do that. We would rather give you the opportunity to feel the lens. We would have built something like the set of the last Highlander fight or similar to make this test for you. We have to wait for things like that until we have a couple of thousand Kubrick members. But we managed to, to get a setup together that's something awesome nonetheless. The Marmalade was so kind to let us use their awesome spike motion control system, their studio and their super nice crew. Thank you so much, you're awesome. Our test camera is mounted on a spike robot that will ensure repeatable movement to give you something that is dynamic but still very comparable. 
Niklas Eichten is on the controls of the spike system. We haste the room and shine two Ari M18 1.8k HMIs from both sides into the lens. A second spike robot is equipped with a 400 watt Joker HMI that will produce moving flares. An Ari sky panel will fill in from the front, so we have a ton of light in the set. This setup is pure optical torture. This will really bring out the best and the worst what these lenses have to offer, especially in terms of sharpness, flaring, contrast and distortions. The candelabra in the background will allow you to judge bokeh. Of course, we know that the haze is kind of counterproductive in a lens test and if you think this makes it irrelevant, go and watch some charts. Dirk the Daring is our knight for a real cinematic motive. The armor is an authentic replica of a knight's armor used in the late medieval and Dirk is an authentic swordsman with decades of experience in the martial art. Together we choreographed an attack move that will work for the shot. For all the tests today we are going to use the Kinefinity Marvel F with a full frame sensor. The Kinefinity has a very practical submount system that allows us to swap PL and F mount on the fly. The 6K sensor will allow us to test two X anamorphic lenses that cover full frame with a 5K 6x5 at 24mm height or if the lens is designed for full perforation 35mm film with a 4K 6x5 crop of 20mm height. That is a bit more than the 18.67mm or four perforations but it works for all candidates. For 1.33 adapters we use the open gate mode utilizing the whole 6K 3 to 2 full frame sensor. We get Dirk ready for shooting, now in full armor. Thanks a lot to Tom Hauser for taking the role of the squire to Dirk. It is impossible to get into the armor without help. Focus is critical for this test and focusing anamorphic is not an easy task. As the overall sharpness is lower, it's harder to judge focus and even focus assists work less reliable. Even with perfect eyesight, a 7 inch camera monitor and punching in for critical focus is recommendable. Even better, just use a large monitor on set like we did. This way you can punch in by just getting closer to the image. As the camera is moving on a robot, we will need remote focus and a Nucleus N will do that job. That also has the benefit that we will have identical focus throws on very different lenses. For lenses with dual focus, we will set the focus on the front position during the moves and simply focus by hand in the wrecking test. We'll do the same for the iris ramping. Now that everything is in place, Let's shoot. We also have a simple setup in our office using a slider to test things like close-up, distortions and general behavior in a less torturous, darker environment. Now that we are clear on the cornerstones of the test, let's start with the Champions League of Anamorphic Solutions – Cine Lenses. In the category of Anamorphic Cine Lenses we have four candidates for you. The PNS Coa Evolution 2x 50mm. The PNS Evolution series are modern adaptations of the legendary Cobra front anamorphic lenses with a classic 2x squeeze. Our second candidate is a vintage Lomus square front 50mm, a real classic and our contrast to the modern lenses in the test. The Lomus has been modded to fit PL and was designed for 35mm film at 4 perforation height. By the way, there are also the so-called Lomo round fronts that use a very Doppler design. So this is a very different lens. Our third and fourth candidates are two focal lengths from the Atlas Orion lineup. 
modern 2x anamorphic cine lenses that are designed to cover 35mm film at 4 perforation height and Alexa open gate. We also have the Atlas Extender that spreads the image and allows the lenses to be used on full frame with a hit to the maximum lens speed. We have the 40mm from the original A set and the 80mm from the newer B set in the test. By the way, Bazin wanted to participate in this test with their new 80mm 1.8 stretch lens that covers full frame and is the same price range as the Orion lenses. And that is not a Varidopter design, but is rumored to use the same method that Tot AO used. Unfortunately, Bazin was not able to deliver a test lens in the time for our principal photography. Sad story. Let's dive. We start with the PNS Cova Evolution 2X. It is a 50mm 2X anamorphic cine lens with PL mount and it weights 1.2 kg and it is 105mm long. Close focus is 1.1 meters. The mount is PL but can be swapped to EF. These lenses were designed to cover 35mm film at full perforation height. The Evolution 2X lenses are based on the design of the Kowa 35BS that use mechanical synchro focus, which makes them very compact for anamorphic lenses, ideal for gimbal and steadicam work. Refer to Scope Chapter 1 for more insights regarding lens design. It has low contrast and flares easily. The lens has expressive pale flares that fall into the colors of the light striking the lens. Center sharpness is good. The sharpness fall off towards the edges is quite dramatic. While it doesn't really hold up to heavy cropping, 16x9 aspect crops work just fine. T2.4 is not particularly fast and wrecking the aperture shows that T2.4 is not really usable. You will want to shoot at T4 or higher to sharpen up a bit. Wrecking focus reveals strong breathing. Bokeh is nice and round at the center and a little distorted towards the sides. The Kova Evolution produces distortions that are, in the best and worst meaning of that word, dramatic. Obviously, filming at close focus of 1.1 meter doesn't improve the distortions. The Kova Evolution 50 mm actually covers a full frame 6x5 crop quite nicely, but of course, objects get even more distorted towards the side. It looks a bit like shooting through a goldfish glass. We got very good results by applying a correction to the full frame 6x5, more about that in our post segment. At around $18,000 plus duties and taxes is the most expensive lens in our test. This is probably something you want to rent and not to buy. Cine1 rents out a 4 lens set at $1,200 per day. Our second candidate is a vintage Lomo square front 50mm that opens up to T2.2. Lomo are Russian lenses reaching back to the Soviet era. Our square front seems to be from 1965 and has been modded to PL of course. Being a relatively old lens that is still in original housing it requires more torque to focus than the other lenses in the test, but it's workable. Like the Evolution it's a mechanical synchro and while it's not as compact it is still light and small compared to vary up the designs. The lens has very warm colors and expressive pale flares that fall into the colors of the light striking the lens. Like it's to be expected, the overall sharpness is not quite as high as modern lenses but it's almost there at a reasonable t-stop. The sharpness fall off is actually much better than with the Cobra Evolution. While it wouldn't crop in heavily, 16x9 aspect crops work just fine. 
Don't expect wonders from the Lomo. T2.2 is unusable, as it was to be expected. T4 would be the minimum of what I would shoot at, but it can look absolutely stunning and surprisingly sharp for a vintage lens with quite a bit of distortions toward the corners. We can show you close focus, as this is already the closest you can focus to, with about 1.6 meters. Using a full frame 6 to 5 crop, we get heavy vignetting and we get over compression, though not as strong as on the Cobra Evolution, but that is partly due to the fact that we can't focus as close. The image of the Lomo seems to be very slightly compressed vertically focusing close, which is probably the reason why close focus is so limited with this lens. It would give you a lot of mumps getting closer. We have computers today and this is an easy fix by stretching the image out vertically for close focus scenes. A Lomo square front like this is usually traded in sets and goes around $10,000 per lens at this time. So the one rents out a three lens set at $700 per day. The Atlas Orion are modern Cinestar lenses that are relatively budget friendly compared to the big guns. They have a classic 2x squeeze and open up to T2. Mounts can be very easily swapped from PL to EF by the user. They are much larger and heavier than the Koa Evolutions or Lomo Square Font. The 80mm is putting 2.7 kilograms on your rig. This is because they use a Verity of the design instead of mechanical synchro, with all the advantages and disadvantages coming with that. The Orions were designed to cover 35mm for perforations. To use these with a full frame 6x5 crop, Atlas has a 1.6x PL mode extender in the program that enables all lenses in the set to cover full frame and, in some cases, way beyond, slowing these lenses to T3.2. The Atlas Orion 80mm delivers a sharp image with high contrast and saturation. The image holds up quite well, even at 200% magnification. Cropping to 16x9 aspect is unproblematic. It produces strong blue streak flares and purple circle flares. Racking focus reveals moderate breathing and a consistent stretch factor. Bokeh is nice and round due to the high blade count of the iris. Ramping the aperture shows while the lens opens to T2, the drop in quality is quite obvious. At T4 everything looks fantastic. Flares remain distinctively blue with warmer light sources. The close focus of 91cm allows to really crawl into your talent without additional diopters. While the 80mm has been designed to cover 4 perforations, we were surprised to see that it actually covers 6x5 full frame with only very mild vignetting when used without the extender. This will deliver a field of view comparable to a 60mm lens when used without the extender. It is quite intriguing that the 80mm can be used as two focal length in this way. Of course, this will give slightly wonky edges, but definitely something one can live with, especially as that wonkiness is even less apparent in close focus. Besides the high weight that comes with the variety of the design, there is very little to complain about, if you like the expressive blue flares. Of course, one needs a wider focal length to get around, so let's just throw in the Atlas Orion with 40mm focal length. 
Specs are the same, it is just a bit shorter and a bit lighter. Again, we will use it on the extender to test it on full frame 6x5. The Atlas Orion 40mm is not quite as sharp as the 80mm, but delivers the same high contrast and saturation with matching flares. 200% magnification reveals the softness, still cropping to 16x9 aspect looks unproblematic. Bokeh is nice and round due to the high blade count of the iris. Ramping aperture shows the same drop in quality when the 40mm is shot wide open. A sweet spot is around T4. Flares remain distinctively blue with warmer light sources and are consistent with the 80mm. The close focus of only 56cm allows quite tight framing for such a wide lens. Removing the extender reveals that the 40mm vignette's hard on the larger format. As the rare elements protrude quite far, the 40mm Atlas Orion cannot be used with the EF to MFT Speed Booster Ultra. The Atlas Orion lenses cost $9000 per focal length and rentals are around $250 per lens or $600 for a 3 lens set per day. The Atlas Orion are pretty much the only real cine lenses in our test that make sense for owner operators that rent out as a side hustle as they have a clear path for repair and replacements. With the extender that goes for $1900, the 80mm and 40mm focal length can be used as a workable microset, always leaving the option to get more focal length later, which can be difficult with the lenses like the Lomo and hellish expensive with the Cova Evolution. The Cova Evolution is definitely an interesting choice for anything that requires low weight and compact form, like gimbal, steadicam or drone work. Images are beautiful, at a price. I was surprised that a lens from the 60s was able to hold its place. The Lomo gives you more distortions than varied up the lenses, but they definitely have their place if creative choices allow for them. Flares and colors are beautiful, and as we said in chapter 1, Perfect is the enemy of the great. Be aware of mechanics that are a far cry for modern lenses and a close focus that is best described as non-existent. We're going to take a second to say thank you very much to Cine One. That's a rental house in Germany that has assorted anamorphic lenses and other stuff, of course. And they gave us the Delomo, the, the uh, Atlas Orion 80mm, the Koa Evolution and an extender for the Atlas Orions. And um, I think this test would only have been half as cool if we were not able to pitch our little Frankenstein lenses against pro-grade and classic anamorphic lenses. So thank you very much to you. And I, I, I told them, you know, I don't think that it makes any sense for you uh, economically because uh, most of our audience is not in Germany and they said never mind we love your channel we love what you do and they were nice enough to give us those lenses for us and for you so I say give them some love go to their website and go to their Instagram and show them some love and if you're ever in Germany or have a project in uh, around Germany please consider them as your rental house thank you Sinewan What's this? Sometimes replicants dream. We invite Forrest and Dan. These guys followed their dream and developed the Atlas Orion lenses. They will talk a bit about the past, present and future of anamorphic, as well as their personal journeys.
What you're going to see now is actually shot on the brand new Atlas Silver Edition. You will immediately notice that unlike the classic Orion lenses from our test, they don't flare blue, but flare in the color of the light source. A memorable time for me in the DIY uh, space was finding the anamorphic shooters group, finding a community of people that were willing to share the same creations and inventions uh, that they were passionate about. At that time I was searching for a solution uh, to shoot anamorphic for myself, but I realized that I was looking for something more. Along that way I met Dan Keynes and together we thought of um, what it is that we would want to bring to ourselves and also to the world. I really cherish the history of anamorphic cinematography and really the most beautiful thing about the history is that some of the most interesting aspects of anamorphic cinematography are the unintended consequences that came from a technical design created by a business mindset to serve artists telling a story. And you know, it's really those unintended consequences, the tool marks of technical design that stay with us today but it's those qualities of the CinemaScope lenses that outlasted the need for the format, and it's what creates the opportunity for Atlas Lens Co. today to cherish and try to preserve and recreate that imaging style. The moment I knew that the Orions were more than just an idea was probably holding them uh, for the first time after assembling the prototypes. I was able to compare them against the original SolidWorks CAD model and realize that this was something that existed in the real world and that you could get an image through it. It was exactly like we designed. I felt like it was something that the world had to see. Some of the unique things about my approach to lens design is to find the specific areas that we would deem character or attributes of a certain lens design and figuring out how to quantify that into the computer, something that we can make uh, into a repeatable task. So I like to seek out um, every aberration or lack of aberration and figure out what it is that we find to be generally a pleasing look. The most surprising moment when building the Orion series and building Atlas Lens Co. with Forrest was just when you think you've got it all figured out, a whole new world opens in front of you and you realize you had no idea what you were doing at all. That's really what I love about optical engineering and optical science. It's the intersection of the tangible and the intangible world. There's things that are right outside of our human perception happening all the time. We have some entirely new product subcategories that are in the pipeline and we think that's really going to change the way people perceive and work with anamorphic cinematography. At Atlas Lens Co., we're rebels with a cause. Thanks Forrest and Dan for hanging and for sharing your dream with us. Can't wait to see what you're coming up with next. Sorry that's so corny, I'm trying to be melodramatic. I hope it's okay. It's the car. You have to start from one of those fundamentals. There's creative ways to use them. There's creative ways to change them and if you can't design it, Forrest and Dan also filmed an in-depth garage talk about anamorphic, DIY, mentors, lens design, character and many other things. It's brilliant and full of interesting things, but too long and detailed for this episode. So we released it as a satellite episode. Link is in the corner and in the description. Watch it, it's worth it. Thanks to Dan's love for the history of anamorphic and the preservation of cinemascope lenses, we can now show you how the original Bausch & Lomb Baltas looked. Cinematographer John Pierce compared Atlas Orion lenses directly against Cinemascope Baltas. An interesting piece for everybody that considers shooting with vintage lenses. We 
repeated the same shot with the same camera, just with the equivalent focal length lens uh, from Atlas to the Bastion Lom. There are obviously massive differences between the lenses, not just in terms of the image, but also from the actual manifestation of the lens, of, of it physically. The Bastion Lom lenses are 15, 20 pounds of lens, uh, very inconsistent across the whole range in terms of color rendition, sharpness of wide open, pretty much makes the lenses almost unusable unless you were going for a very stylized look. So all those technological differences in terms of precision and consistency, I think that's going to be, it's obvious because there's 50 years between uh, the thinking around these, these two lenses. But I think what the goal of this video was to do and what I think it does is it, it shows that the Atlas lenses still retain sort of the original intentions of what anamorphic was meant to do. That transporting of somebody into a different way of seeing the world, a different way of presenting a story. And it's more than just shining a flashlight into the lens and getting a, a lens flare. It, it's, it's how the lens is, with everything all together, a reusable tool for consistent filmmaking and storytelling, but also still retains some character. I think what this video does, at least to me, really nicely, it shows that whilst a lot of the technological inconsistencies have been corrected, there is still an almost very real homage to the original look of Anamorphic in terms of its character and its look and feel. So that narrative of whilst dependable and reliable and consistent, the Atlas lenses haven't taken away from anamorphic they've only served to improve it i think presenting that idea in uh, a nice approachable way is really where this video can help serve to show some of the uh, intentions behind atlas and what it's always been trying to do when it comes to providing tools to people to go off and tell stories Anamorphic really has come a long way. Thanks a lot for producing this insightful piece, John, and for sharing your work with us. Please visit John's website at johnpierce.com. I'll put a link in the description. Let's go to the next category of anamorphic solutions using anamorphic lens attachments for projector lenses, sometimes simply called projector lenses. Embarrassing. Bite me, Deckard. The high prices for anamorphic lenses put them well out of reach for the vast majority of filmmakers of all stripes. Clever DIY users came up with a simple idea. Instead of using the lenses that have been designed for filming anamorphic, one can use the lenses that are used to project anamorphic films, as the general principle of squeezing and de-squeezing remains the same. Of course, using a projector lens comes with a lot of downsides. Most projector systems don't come as a complete lens, but as a separate spherical lens that allows spherical projections and as an anamorphic attachment that will go on top of that lens. With very few exceptions, projector lenses don't have an iris. Why would they? If one would need an image to be less bright, one would simply reduce the brightness of the lamp and rather save energy. Spherical projector lenses usually don't have a focus system, as focus is achieved by changing the flange. Also, one never ramps their focus during the showing of a movie. Most systems have to be focused on the spherical lens and the attachment separately making them dual focus systems. There are exceptions and we are going to test one of them. Of course, projector lenses don't have any mount that is adaptable in a conventional way. Projector lenses are usually not very wide unless they are used in a very short throw scenario, for example in a flight simulator. Anamorphic lenses are used for movie projections that always have a somewhat narrow angle of view. 
a huge server screen comes with a huge theater and the relation between screen size and distance between projector and screen remains about the same. Some shortcomings can be easily fixed. Instead of pairing the attachment with the intended projector lens, one can pair the attachment with an ordinary lens intended for film or photography that provides the desired mount, iris and focus. This will not solve the problem with a narrow angle of view, meaning that you can pair an anamorphic projector attachment with a wide angle taking lens. All you need is a way to properly mount the attachment, which can be challenging. Some systems come without any threads, and those who have threads usually don't have them in the right places or in standard sizes. The solution is to attach them with clamps or custom solutions for every given attachment. This will create a workable solution that requires to focus on the spherical lens and the adapter lens. This is fine for beginners and for testing the look of a system. Practically, it's horrible. Even with good training, it is nearly impossible to pull focus in a production environment, at least in a reliable and repeatable way. This is why a single focus solution is very much recommendable. We will talk about that in a second. Anamorphic projector attachments are usually designed for the common film formats 8mm, 60mm and 35mm. Most of the projector lenses that are used in DIY solutions are designed for 60mm projectors as they are smaller and lighter than the 35mm attachment and provide a decent angle of view. Most allow focal lengths down to 50mm on Super 35 and 75mm on full frame. Projector lenses for 35mm are bigger and much heavier. This is a hypergona that was designed for 60mm. And this is a hypergona designed for 35mm. This is an ISCO designed for 60mm. And this is an ISCO designed for 35mm. Usually, 35mm attachments have a larger rear element than 60mm lenses, given the larger format they were designed for. This means they allow for bigger front elements on the taking lens and the iris to be wider open. But as you usually don't shoot anamorphic faster than f2.8, to achieve a decent sharpness, this is not a practical advantage. Hence, the widened says becomes a burden without a benefit, making 35mm attachments less attractive in a normal shooting environment. As 8mm was used mostly for amateur filming and distribution of anamorphic movies in that format was limited, there are very few anamorphic solutions for the format. Still, there are a couple of so-called baby scopes on the market that have their fans and the good ones are quite expensive. They can be used even on large formats by using longer focal lengths. We are going to test four projector attachments for you. A relatively modern ISCO Ultrastar Red, a Hypergona for 60mm projectors, a Hypergona designed for 35mm projectors, a very compact Bell & Howell and a Kowa 8Z. All of them have a 2x stretch factor. We're going to test them using a full frame 6x5 crop for classic cinema aspect ratio. As our taking lenses, we will use our favorite vintage lenses. Our test uses fast vintage lenses. Lenses with huge front elements, much bigger than all of the rare elements of our attachments. This will introduce vignetting. We have a lot more on that in our later sections about taking lenses. We really liked the look in most of our tests and found the vignetting to be tolerable, even attractive. Now, with the main night test and due to its brightness, that vignette caused the attachments to underperform in that specific setup. You live and you learn. With the darker setups, those lenses look very nice. I think we will demonstrate that you can achieve very usable images with the right focal length with a mismatch of lens sizes. To get something more usable in a normal shooting environment, one can attach a variable diopter in front of the projector attachment and taking lens combination, achieving a single focus solution. All you need to do is to focus the taking lens and the anamorphic attachment to infinity and the variable adopter will allow simple and precise focusing. 
as well as practical focus ramping. There's a variety of Varia diopters by different manufacturers for different price points on the market. We will put links for popular choices in the description. This is a hardcore DNA that is very popular and delivers a high quality image. Most variable diopters are optimized for the normal range, meaning that they don't work optimal on longer focal length. Rapido has a variable diopter in the program that is optimized for longer focal lengths. As always, there are drawbacks with the usual variable diopters. To allow for a relatively wide field of view, variable diopters have to be quite big and that makes them heavy. As projector lenses usually don't have threads, the Vario Diopters requires alternative mounting solutions, as they have to be in front of the anamorphic block. The weight of the system is far off the center, creating a lot of leverage. Using rails and lens support becomes essential to protect your gear. Rapido offers a housing solutions for many different attachments called Front Metal Jacket, or short FMJ. It deals with a lot of problems with providing suitable threads on both ends and a super sturdy connections to the rails, making wiggle a thing of the past. There are no FMJs for 35mm attachments because they would just be too large. For a test, the Isco Red Star, the 60mm Hypergona and the Kowa are housed in a front metal jacket and are focused using a hardcore DNA Vario Diopter. The first lens in the test is the Isco Ultrastar Red. It's a 60mm attachment famous for being sharp and infamous for being resistant to flaring. Built by Isco in Germany, it is small and light and has a large entrance pupil and a quite large rear element, allowing high shooting speeds. It weighs 500 grams just by itself and is 90mm long. With 24mm sensor height and 6x5 aspect, we managed to pair it with lenses as wide as 75mm. The Isco Red comes in different versions named 2.1 or 2.4 that only differ in the focal length of the spherical lens that comes with the Ultrastar. That is, if the Ultrastar is sold with a spherical lens. The anamorphic part is the same in all versions. Isco also has 35mm projector lenses that suffer from the problems we just talked about, so we recommend to stay in the 60mm realm. Lately, there are a lot of offers on eBay that only contain the spherical lens, counting on ignorant buyers. The spherical part will not replace the taking lens as it neither offers focus nor iris. You want the anamorphic part of the lens and you only want that part. The ISCO has metric threads on the inside of the rear and there are some elegant solutions for lightweight and compact mounting that are so much nicer than bulky clamps. Just don't try to use that with a Vari Diopter without proper support. A little goodie, the focus ring of the ISCO can be locked. We are going to use a 90mm Leica Sumicron R as our taking lens. The Isco's modern coating works well in the torture set. It's amazingly sharp and clear for a projector lens. Colors and contrast look great. At 200% we can see my disability to pull focus, but I nail the forward position and here the Isco shows its glory. We are in Atlas Orion territory here. Subsequently, a 16x9 crop looks perfectly fine. But our setup also shows the problem with the ISCO. Even in extreme situations, horizontal flares are next to absent due to advanced multi-coding. Good for projectors, not so fashionable for filmmakers. Racking focus reveals moderate breathing and good performance from close to far. Ramping the aperture shows that the ISCO is already reasonably sharp at around f2.8. For the low light setup, we're going to switch the lens to a 85mm contact size at f4. You can see little more vignetting due to the slightly wider lens. Overall, the setup performs very well, but the absence of horizontal flares makes the image less charismatic compared to other solutions. 
Thanks to the Verity Opta setup, the ISCO shows next to no distortions. Even at the minimum working distance of 70 cm, the image looks flat and there's no meaningful overcompression you will have to have an eye on. At time of release, the ISCO Altostar Red was traded for around $500 if in good shape. We will put links in the description. It could be the mother of all anamorphic attachments if the image had a bit more anamorphic character in the flares. In Scope Chapter 3 we will show you how you can remove coatings of your ISCO or any other projector attachment to enhance the flare characteristics. We will also show you that the color of the flare varies a lot depending on randomly different coatings on the same lens. This will help you to achieve the type and intensity of flare you desire. Of course, without hurting the glass of your precious attachment. This will be awesome. Our next candidate is the Hypergona 16mm. Built by Henri Chrétien's very own company, it is tiny and has a quite small entrance pupil that limits lenses at about f2.4. You can use faster lenses, but you're not going brighter when opening beyond f2.4. Not that you really want that anyways. It weights 560 grams just by itself. Shooting 6 to 5 with 24mm height, we got the Hypergona to pair with lenses as wide as 75mm, without a variety opter of course, that will cost you a little field of view. There have been many many versions of this lens and we have some of them, but we will not have the time to compare these to each other. For the night test, we are going to pair it with the Canon FD 85mm f1.2 as spherical as the taking lens. This is a hard mismatch of element sizes, so the Hypergona works as an external iris causing mechanical vignetting. More of that in Scope Chapter 3. We are using a slightly smaller crop to compensate. We immediately see that the Hypergona's image quality is a far cry from the cine lenses and our torture setup takes the lens to town, showing an overall mushy look. We can see that it produces expressive golden flares and some weird ghosting of the light source. 200% magnification reveals the softness. Cropping to 16x9 aspect looks somewhat acceptable. When we rack focus we see strong breathing. And we see that the low blade count of the Canon FD causes visible edges in the bokeh. Wrecking the iris shows that shooting open at f2.4 produces strong astigmatism. Closing down to f4 sharpens the image to something quite usable and f5.6 gives some bite. As bad as the Hypergona 16 handles the torture setup, in the low light setup the image is very pleasant and offers a good balance between image quality and an expressive anamorphic look. Especially in this setup, the strong golden flares look lovely. Distortions are quite severe towards the sides. The minimum working distance of a hot core DNA at 70 cm looks like this. And again, distortions are strong. Of course, the distortions are quite easily fixed in post, at the price of a reduced field of view. The Hypergona 16 leaves a lot to wish for, but considering the price, it can look amazing in the right circumstances. Just don't torture it with too much light and keep it to f4. Before you dismiss the Hypergona as inferior to the ISCO, all of our Blade Runner spoofs in Chapter 1, 2 and 3 have been filmed with the Hypergona 16. The Leon sequences in combination with the Canon FD 85mm spherica at 24mm sensor height and the Bryant sequences in combination with the Leica 90mm at 20mm sensor height. We chose the Hypergona over the ISCO as it provides a softer vintage look, fitting the original Blade Runner shots a bit better. At time of release, this Hypergona 16 was traded for around $400 in good shape, if you can find one. 
More or less out of curiosity, we threw in the big brother of the 16, a Hypergona 35. Basically the same projector lens made by Chrétien, but designed for 35mm instead of 16mm projectors. Is there any benefit that could outweigh putting up with the practical disadvantages? First of all, the much larger size doesn't allow the use of a front metal jacket or hardcore DNA. So practical considerations have to be taken in account. The 35 weights a hefty 1.57 kg and the total length of 18 cm in addition to the length of the taking lens will offset that weight, making it very cumbersome even when used as a dual focus setup. The large rear element of the 35 allows for faster apertures in a larger front element in the taking lens. We tried up to f1.2, not that it's a good idea. That doesn't mean that the 35 offers a wider field of view. With 6 to 5 and a 24mm sensor height, we were able to pair it with lenses as wide as about 90mm. For a better comparison to the Hypergonor 16, we paired the 35 with the same Canon FD 85mm f1.2 as spherical as the taking lens, but we cropped in by 20% to compensate for the narrow field of view. As we don't have a single focus solution, we can pull the focus. Focus is locked on the night in the starting position. The Hypergona 35 looks very similar to the 16. It produces the same expressive golden flares and some ghosting of the light sources. Surprisingly, the much larger rare element doesn't improve vignetting. To 100% magnification shows that the image is actually softer than the 16. Cropping to a 16 by 9 aspect looks somewhat acceptable. Wrecking focus is next to impossible with dual focus, and this shows how important a solid setup is. Without something like a front metal jacket, you will always introduce wiggle that is just way too obvious. This example also shows what happens if you focus your taking lens and anamorphic block the wrong way. Your bokeh shows a horizontal stretch. With this weak setup, even changing the aperture causes visible wiggle. Just like with the 16, the Hypergona 35 looks just much better in the dark setup. We can see that it gets a quite sharp image at f4. And it shows way less distortions compared to the 16. The overall look and especially the flares are beautiful. At f4 the image is quite crisp and even at 200% magnification it seems to be usable in this context. The large entrance pupil allows to open the taking lens wide, but as you can see, the image quality drops drastically. This will also introduce circle flares, like we have seen them in our episode about ultra-fast lenses. Interesting. The weight and size, as well as the lack of a single focus solution that neither breaks your arm nor the bank, makes the Hypergona 35 very unpractical, which is probably why it is by far the cheapest option in our test. At the time of release, the Hypergona was traded around $250, making it a nice toy for first steps in DIY anamorphic. We will put a link in the description. The Bell & Howell is one of the weird projector lenses out there. It is tiny, it has a very narrow build and unlike most other attachments, a small built-in varieter opter, making it a great candidate for a compact single focus setup. Of course, that comes with its own set of challenges. It has a 2x squeeze and the narrow build takes its toll on the field of view. With 24mm sensor height and 6x5 aspect, we were able to pair it with lenses as wide as 120mm. For the test, we are going to pair the B&H with a 135mm Canon FD as the taking lens. The B&H is actually the native lens attachment for a Bell & Howell 16mm projector that you see in the low light setup. As the gate sits quite far on the back of the projector, the attachment has to be long and narrow, simply to clear the projector's body. 
Unmodded, it is next to impossible to pull focus with the B&H. This is why our test shot is focused on the front position and you can only adjust the sharpness on that position. And we were surprised. Focus racking will reveal the problem with the Veridiopter. The helicoid needs to be rotated several times to go from close to infinity focus. And that can take a while. Plus the movement is very obvious in the shot. Don't worry, there's a way to mod the lens to give you a convenient focus throw in just a couple of simple steps using the right gear. We will show you the required gear and give you a step-by-step -step guide in scope chapter 3. Ramping the aperture shows that f2.8 is pretty useless and that shooting at f5.6 is a good idea. Shooting in the low light set at f4 produces an image that is a bit mushy and warmer than the other scopes. Still, the Bell & Howell produces interesting flares and something far out of the ordinary. Working distance without additional diopters is around 60 cm. As it already has a varied diopter included, the Bell & Howell allows for relatively cheap, very light and compact 2x setups that work even without support. At time of release, the B&H was traded for around $500 in good shape, that is, if you can find one at all, as they became quite rare. We will put links in the description. Linton from the Marmalade gave us his Koa 8Z to put it in the test. We only had it for the night test and not for the low light test or for the tabletop shots. So that test is kind of incomplete. Still, we thought it might be especially interesting to see it side by side to the Koa Evolution lens. We tested the 8Z on an 85mm contact size with a hardcore DNA for single focus. Just like the Hypergonas, the 8Z doesn't agree with the mismatched rear and front elements. The mechanical vignetting makes the 8Z underperform in the bright setup. This version shows golden flares quite similar but not as expressive as the one from the Hypergona. Even though this setup is very similar to all our other setups, we had a real problem to get it sharp. The Koa is usually a very sharp lens. Our test just doesn't reflect that at all. I didn't miss the focus, this is just all we got out of it. Maybe the lens was misaligned, well, we have to admit that we don't know what happened there. This is a 16x9 crop and when we pitch this directly against the Koa Evolution at the same crop, you can see that the difference in contrast and sharpness is quite dramatic. Side by side and with the Evolution magnified to 200% to match better, you can see how much the evolution leaves the AZ in the dust. I kind of doubt that a different choice in taking lens would have made a huge difference in this context. At time of release, the Koa 8Z was traded around $1000. Every project lens we tested comes with its very own set of strengths and weaknesses. By far the sharpest in the test is the Isco Ultrasar Red, which is not surprising given that it's the most modern with the most advanced coatings. In that regard, it is the only projector lens that comes close to a modern cinema lens like the Atlas, while not getting there completely of course. The lack of flares is, well, a no-go criterion for many, but like we said earlier, if you're ready to go a step further, there are ways to make the ISCO flare quite elegantly. 
You will find a complete guide on that in Scope Chapter 3. A lens with a good balance between a clear image and vintage character is the Hypergona 16. While not too convincing in a torture setup, it shines in normal conditions, which is why we chose to use it for the Blade Runner spoofs. If you want something compact and low profile, the B&H might be for you, if you're willing to do a bit of modding. Before we continue with anamorphic adapters, the media division is always interested in a little education beyond filmmaking. And in this spirit, we would like to tell you that a medieval knight would not close his visor in a sword fight. He would just leave his helmet open. We opted to close the helmet because it just looks cooler and the whole armor looks more threatening with the visor closed. By the way, the man in the armor is Dirk. Is that really a coincidence? <laughs> So I would like to introduce you to Dirk. Uh, he's our knight, our talent for today. And what looks like a bit of a weird cosplay for Game of Thrones. He's actually an expert for medieval uh, swordsmanship. I don't know if that's the right term. You may say swordsmanship, yeah. Okay. Fighting in general is what okay, we do. It's a real martial art. And this is actually a real knight's armor, like it would have been done in the time of well, yeah, around 1480, 1470 to 1480. It's a replica, of course. It's not an original. Nobody could afford that and actually wear it in order to have you beat up. Oh, oh right. Of and course. so it, it, it has a lot of scars and dents already. So yeah. it has certainly seen some kind of action. Okay. And it's, it, it's very, very heavy, right? Well, it's not really very heavy. It is a bit beyond or under 30 kilograms. So that is quite decent uh, considering it is uh, distributed over the entire body. Yeah. So it is much more stressful to have a backpack of that, well, of that weight. Okay. I was always, you showed me that the first time almost 20 years ago when you, we got to know each other and he kept his weight so he can still wear that armor. If you're getting older, that's a hard thing to do. And I was really mm -hmm. impressed with that because when I first saw this in, in movies, I'd always thought that this is mainly um, held together by these kind of belts and so. But the really important parts are really like clever mechanism that snap into each other, which I would never have been thought would have been possible at the time. Well, it is ingenious craftsmanship. No? Yeah. It's, that's correct. It is held together by straps and buckles, but by rivets too. And so you have an extraordinary amount of articulation and you need to have, because otherwise, if you can't move on a battlefield, the first thing that happens is you lie on the ground, can't get up, and you're bloody dead. Well, that's cool. If you want to know more about uh, Swordsmith and how it really worked in those days, uh, Dirk translates uh, manuscripts from that time from Sword Masters of the Medievals, and you can buy his books. Um, we have a link in the description of this video, so if you're interested, check it out. Dirk, thank you very much for being on night today. You're welcome. It is way more complex to get in and out of that armor than you think, and it can get really demanding to carry that load over a long shooting period, so it is even more appreciated. Before you get cocky, while the eyewear is certainly not historically correct, spectacles were invented around 200 years before an armor like this would have been forged. The third alternative to shoot anamorphic is the use of adapters that, unlike the projector lenses, have been specifically designed for the purpose of shooting anamorphic. Therefore, they are usually simpler to adapt and to focus. Most adapters came into existence after the revival of anamorphic, so they are modern lenses with characteristics that try to suit the desire of the marketplace. While there are adapters with a classic 2x stretch factor, the majority of adapters has lower squeeze factors like 1.5x and 1.33x, so they can utilize more of the sensor estate, with the cost of having muted anamorphic characteristics. Lower squeeze factors allow wider taking lenses, and most adapters can achieve a very wild field of view, so you're not as limited as you are with projector attachments. While even with 1.33 anamorphic, flares can be expressive, Bokey looks spherical, which is why 1.33x anamorphic is frowned upon by purists. While it is absolutely true that 1.33x will never look like Cinemascope, one should keep in mind that Ultra Panavision 70 has a 1.25x squeeze, 
and many iconic movies like The Hateful Eight, Ben-Hur, or Rogue One were shot using a squeeze factor of only 1.25x. Anamorphic is more than 2x, just don't use 1.33x when you desire a 2x look. And if you are a manufacturer, don't sell 1.33x as something that gives you the anamorphic look, even though it might be tempting. If you use 1.33x or 1.5x, embrace the look as something in its very own right. In the right context, it can look awesome. Modern adapters with a lower squeeze factor can offer the practical edge and give you more details through lower astigmatism and modern coatings. All that while supporting wide-angle lenses. We are going to test three anamorphic adapters for you. A Panasonic LA7200. A Letos Anamorphix. And an SLR Magic 50. All of them have 1.33x stretch factor. We are going to test them using 3x2 open gate full frame for 2x1 aspect ratio. A 16x9 sensor or sensor crop will produce a 2x3 9 to 1. Again, we will pair them with our favorite vintage lenses, but in some cases with much shorter focal lengths. The SLR Magic Anamorphic 50 has been on the market for a while and it's still in production, meaning you can actually buy or replace one without much fuss. It is relatively small and light and has a 62mm thread size on the rear and a 77mm in the front. It has a focusing option that is not a very diopter system, but a simple focus with near and far position, which is way too imprecise. It is actually a bit picky with taking lenses and we had very different results with different taking lenses. On full frame, using the whole sensor you can get as wide as 50mm. The adapter with the taking lens alone is a crude dual focus, but as 1.33 stretch factors produce less astigmatism, focusing the adapter is much easier than with projector lenses. Which is why we use double focus in our test, meaning we couldn't rack focus and focus is set to the frontal position. Keep that in mind. can immediately see that the SLR Magic Anamorphic 50 produces very bluish and distinctive horizontal flares. A 200% magnification reveals decent sharpness, but nothing close to something like the ISCO, even though 1.33 has less astigmatism than 2x. Racking focus shows that bokeh looks, as suspected, very spherical. Ramping the iris shows that the large entrance pupil of the SLR allows you to shoot wide open. And what a bad idea that is. f2.8 would be our recommended maximum. The SLR works very well and the flares give you a somewhat anamorphic vibe. You can focus the SLR to quite close objects during the near position. We achieved 50 cm. On smaller sensors like Micro Four Thirds, it benefits from the shorter focal length that creates a deeper depth of field. We found it to match quite well with Micro Four Third and the Lumix Vario G 12 to 35 that covers starting around 22 mm. And because that combo is super low profile, light, and flexible, you can use it to shoot in situations where anamorphic lenses are usually not a good idea, like we did here, taking it on a roller coaster. When the SLR's own focus is in the right ballpark, out of focus does actually work, which can be helpful when shooting in such environments. The flares are actually the best reason to use this adapter instead of shooting straight spherical. The blue is very intense and the flares look inelegant compared to other options, but as always, it depends what you're going for. And if you go for popping colors in something psychedelic, it can be exactly the flare to look for. At the time of the release, the SLR was sold for around $500. We will put links in the description.
Our next candidate is the Litus Anamorphix 1.33X, and that is a massive piece of glass in a housing that is built like a tank. It is short with only 8 cm, but it weights a hefty 1.27 kilos. So, lens support is an absolute must when using the Letos, which is why it has the option to attach one directly. It has a built in clamp to adapt 140mm cine lenses, but of course, you can just use any lens with a 140mm donut ring. Using a cine lens is a very good idea with the Letus, as the lens support at the adapter will not allow a lens to extend during focus or zoom unless you build a sliding system of sorts. The Letus holds what the SLR promises. Sharp images and wide angles accepting lenses as wide as 28mm on 3x2 full frame, making it the record holder of adapters. The Litus wouldn't fit inside a normal matte box and it comes with its own matte box that attaches directly to the adapter. It has geared focus with markings and a longer throw. Don't get your hopes up, dual focus racking is still unpractically complex. While the Litus can go super wide, we opted to stay in the same ballpark as the other lenses in the test, using an 80mm Mamiya Seiko C f1.9, a medium format lens that we coined the Dark Knight, as it is rumored to have been used in the film of the same name. In combination with a 0.7 focal reducer, the lens is an effective 55mm f1.3. The 1.33x stretch factor with a medium format lens makes this the closest you can get to a Super Panavision 70 look using full frame. If you have been on this channel for a while, the Litus was also used for a gun video in our lighting episode. Just like the SLR, the Litus is a dual focus system and you're stuck at that as you will not be able to get a vario adopter large enough. You will not achieve perfect focus in the whole range unless you do dual focus racking. As the Litus is way more forgiving than a 2x system, it will allow you to get reasonable sharpness if the adapter is set in the right ballpark. 200% magnification shows a nice cinematic softness, but little anamorphic characteristics. Wrecking focus shows that there's no oval bokeh, like is to be expected with a 1.33 stretch. This setup also shows the problem with the extended Mamiya lens. Our sliding lens support didn't slide well enough so you can easily see me fiddling with the lens during focus racking. If your subject or camera is not moving and you hit dual focus perfectly, the Litus is very sharp while not biting too hard. Basically, what I liked about the images of films like Rogue One and The Hateful Eight. Ramping the iris shows that the Litus can be used wide open with decent results. Not f1.3 wide open, but f2 wide open which is by far the best in the test. It works well in the low light setup and as the subject stays on the same focal plane, you can better judge how sharp it is. This combo can focus to a working distance of 45 cm. Litus offers a medium flare and a low flare version. This is supposed to be the medium flare version, but as you can see, horizontal flares are mostly absent. Not that this has to be a problem. You can build your own flare characteristics with the setup like we did in our gun test. We will talk about how to do that in scope chapter 3. Some will miss the oval bokeh, but particularly this shot shows how sexy a honeycomb bokeh can look. And remember, Ultra Panavision 70 doesn't have overbooker either. Everything about the Lita screams professional. The build, the weight and the price. At the time of the release, the Anamorphix was sold for $2,700 by Litus and for around $2,000 used. We will put links in the description. Our last candidate in the test is the Panasonic LA7200, 
And it is an odd one out. You hear that right. Panasonic, not Panavision. Wishful thinking. The LA7200 was built and sold as an attachment for the Panasonic DVX100 camcorder. Unlike most other adapters that have been designed to achieve cine aspect ratio with wide sensors, the LA was designed to achieve 16x9 images using a 4x3 sensor. If a 1.33 stretches a 4x3 to 16x9, it also stretches a 16x9 to 2.39x1 or a 3x2 to 2x1, what we are going to do with it. The LA can be easily equipped with standard 72mm threads without hassle. Although the lens elements are relatively big, the adapter is light at 380 grams, which of course means that it has a super flimsy plastic housing. You can't have everything. The LA doesn't have any focusing option, and it might be at the center of the focus through myth. Just like with any other adapters, you can't focus with a system with just the taking lens. The LA is fixed focused to a certain point. If you offset the focus with the taking lens, astigmatism will reduce the sharpness. With the DVX100 only being standard definition and the deep depth of field that small 1 3rd inch CCDs on that camera produce, the loss of sharpness was just kind of irrelevant. If you want to go close, you have to have diopters in your back. More about that in a second and in scope chapter 3. Still, it is one of the few adapters that is light enough, has a wide enough field of view and a large enough rare element to be a candidate for DIY anamorphic zoom setups. The LA works best with a wide lens and a medium distance to subject, something like we got here using a Canon FD 35mm concave. You can already tell by the candles in the background how the sharpness falls apart towards the sides. Unlike the liters, it produces nice horizontal flares out of the box. And as you can see in this context, focusing just the taking lens is sufficient. And there goes your focus through myth. When we reframe this to 2.39 by 1, we see a quite handsome overall anamorphic look. Sharpness is withstanding a 200% magnification, at least in the center. Racking focus shows nothing unexpected, like the lack of over bokeh. Ramping the iris shows that the LA stays usable wide open dealing nicely with a maximum aperture of f2 on the 35mm concave. The second test setup reveals that the wide field of view might be practical, but that it's also kind of boring, at least in this setup. The deep depth of field sucks the magic right out of it. It also reveals that the LA7200 is rarely really sharp, but it's sufficiently so in most situations when a wide lens is used. For a close focus, you are going to need diopters and the LA has no threads on the front. One simple method is to simply use 70mm diopters like this from Vivitar. They are not great, but sufficient with the LA. More about those in our diopter feature in scope chapter 3. As the opening of the LA is 108mm high, you can make them stick inside that way. Not elegant, but fast to swap. And that will be important when working with the LA. This way you can focus very close, but the 77mm diopter will reduce the available field of view, so you will have to use a longer lens or crop a little to avoid hard vignetting. The Panasonic LA700 offers a hint of a wide anamorphic look with little effort and weight, which is why the LA became so popular and hard to get. At time of release, the Panasonic LA7200 was traded for $1000 in good shape. Links are in the description. From the three adapters we tested, we can't really name a favorite. The LA700 is somewhat easy to use, but it's quite unpredictable. Sometimes it looks great, and sometimes you just can't make it work. The SLR Magic is somewhat interesting, especially with a lower price. We are not madly in love with the overpowered blue flares, but it suits color crazy scenes quite well. If you're willing to pay the price and you know what you're getting into, the Litus is surely the best option 
for personal, medium format Ultra Panavision 70 setup. Don't you wish it was as practical as it looks good? Lately there have been a couple of new budget lenses by Serui with 1.33 stretch for smaller formats, making the subject a lot more practical and affordable. We haven't used any of those and we are not terribly thrilled with the footage we've seen, so we didn't include those in the test. We prefer the more expressive look, the flexibility and customizability that the DIY options deliver if one decides to go down the budget road. Before we go into tips and tricks with alternative usage and ideas for shooting anamorphic, let's have a look at the whole range in the test. It's a game of trade-offs. As always in the filmmaker world, you have to balance between the budget, the look you want to achieve and every given scenario to get the result you desire. Experience and trying out a lot of things in the specific circumstances will give you the anamorphic recipe that works for you the scene and your wallet. Never underestimate the practical aspects of a production. What good is a nice look or an affordable solution if you use your best takes because of missed focus? If you have a crew to pay and a long shot list, we definitely recommend renting cine lenses. The cost will be easily outweighed with the time you save. The results will improve and your talent will appreciate if you don't have to fiddle around too much, as that will change dynamics and the atmosphere on set a lot. Still, it is nice to know that even with very limited resources, one can get amazing results and an image so individual that it separates one work from the crowd. And if it's just about the look, how would you compare a $10,000 cine lens with a $500 projector attachment? or a wide 2x cine lens against a wide 1.33 adapter, or a modern lens against a vintage one. Let's battle a bit. Can you tell which is which? So, how did that go for you? Were you spot on? Did we fool you here and there? Or did you manage to fool yourself? Let us know in the comments. Of course, even using YouTube at 8K for maximum bandwidth leaves things to desire. 
and maybe you want to play around with the native log footage and the LUTs we created for the test. Or create your very own grade. You can, with our action packs. We have three membership tiers that you can choose to support our work and to get access to awesome perks. With the Scott membership, you can support us with 99 cents per month. That will help us to make better and more complex episodes in shorter time. It's up to you. Also, you have access to member-only content like the Film Emulation Deep Dive. Our Kubrick and Lynch members will have access to the Scope Chapter 2 Action Pack that includes footage for each option in the test. As native ProRes 444 log with the fitting LUTs to recreate the look you saw on the test. We will also include the Unicorn LUT that we used to create the dream sequences in the Atlas part of the episode. To be able to use any of those LUTs with your specific camera, we didn't only include the native LUTs for log, but also Rec. 709 LUTs. So all you have to do is to apply the standard Rec. 709 LUT of your camera and then create a second node where you apply the Rec. 709 version of the Knight or Unicorn LUTs. See these LUTs as a basis for your grade. They're like a bouillon cube for your very special soup. Just add a third node and regrade whatever fits your specific footage. If you have any questions, you can meet us in our closed Facebook group. I'll put a link in the description. Lynch and Kubrick members will not only have access to the action packs of this episode, but also to all the action packs that came with past episodes. If you want to really have an in-depth discussion, our Kubrick members can request individual consulting per mail. Or if you prefer, we can do that in a Zoom call, too, with live on-screen and overhead explanations. And of course, you will get a place in the Hall of Fame at the end of each of our epic episodes. All our members will have early access to Scope Chapter 3, that is all about the devilish little details. Modding, making the best out of your footage in post and our bias guide, so get ahead of the crowd and join the media division. The future of independent content made for you is, isn't that ironic, in your hands. What's this? Our scope episodes have the goal to give you a solid overview about everything anamorphic. But of course, we can't show you, nor do we have expertise with even the fraction of the lenses or adapters out there. If there's something like an authority in DIY anamorphic, it is Chito Fajadans with his YouTube channel Anamorphic on a Budget. I'll put a link in the description. Chito has a dedicated video about any lens and adapter you've practically ever heard of as well as the brilliant tips and guides all around the subject. Hey folks, Chitta Fahadangs here from Anamorphic on a Budget. As the name says, my work is all about creating the anamorphic look without exploding the budget. Sometimes that involves renting very expensive gear. Sometimes it's about building your own DIY setup. And sometimes it's about faking the whole thing using modified lenses. The anamorphic look is just another resource in your library. And I work very hard to make sure filmmakers from all budget levels can create something that looks fancier than they thought they could. I have a deep understanding of how anamorphic lenses and adapters work. That comes from reviewing dozens of them on my channel. And I can get a good evaluation of how an anamorphic adapter will perform just by taking a quick look at it. That is for sure my superpower. Besides making gear reviews, I've been working on a long-term course which goes from the origins of the anamorphic format to building your own setup and then editing your CinemaScope footage. The Anamorphic Cookbook has new videos coming out weekly and you can get even more of them by becoming a member of my channel. Last, if you're feeling lost, there's a place where all anamorphic shooters gather and that is the Facebook group, Anamorphic Shooters. I've been an admin there for years and it's the largest collaborative space to get your questions answered and to showcase your work. If you plan on joining, just make sure you answer the questions properly. I'm Chita Fahedings and I'm out. All of the subjects we covered so far are for shooting Anamorphic in a quite conventional way. But there are some interesting things you can do with Anamorphic that go beyond that.
One cool thing is with anamorphic lenses, you don't have to use them in a horizontal way. You can play around for creative and practical use. Let's turn. Now, think you're producing for a 16 to 9 end result. If you shoot anamorphic, you would think that you have to crop into the uh, white screen on the sides until you have a final 16 by 9 aspect ratio. But if you do what we just did by turning the camera on the side, but still putting the lens in a horizontal um, position, you don't have to throw away much real estate of the sensor, much less as if you would have to uh, zoom into your shot to reach 16 by 9 aspect ratio. You really keep a lot of your real estate. While you have to crop in 15% less using this method, we see that the difference in perceived detail is still neglectable. But this method does give you much improved options for multi-format release if you're aiming for 16 by 9 square and 9x16 releases. If you keep your camera in a horizontal uh, orientation but rotate the lens by 90 degrees, you can have an aspect ratio which is more like um, a square. Maybe you want to shoot for Instagram or for some other medium that uh, allows you square medium or even something more narrow where you can crop in. It has some other advantages too, and that is that the flares are now vertical. That allows you to do very stylized and interesting thing that are, can be look very creative. A good example is Audio Slave and Be Yourself. Just to be clear, this Audio Slave video most probably used streak filters and not vertical anamorphic. It is just an example for the creative use of vertical flares. And of course, there's one thing that can really be vomit-inducing. You can just turn an anamorphic lens left and right to give you really like weird, wonky effects to make it very, very disorientating. Just like a Dutch angle, this effect can be used to show that something is off. David Fincher used it in Alien 3 to make you feel that the shit, or rather Sardonum Spa, is about to hit the fan. I'm sure there are a million ways to use anamorphic in a creative way, and that most of those haven't even been tried before. So it's up to you. Show us what you can do. The sky is the limit. What's this? Of course, anamorphic is designed for filmmaking and not for photography. But exactly that is what makes anamorphic interesting for photographers. What Dan from Atlas calls the tool marks of anamorphic cinematography can give a photo the look and feel that separates it from other people's work. This is Dick, and he's so nice to tell us a bit about his process while we show you some of his work. My name is Dick Sweeney. I am a stills photographer. I do a lot of work for the advertising design world. Um, but really, my work is about small moments. Um, I think the anamorphic process helps to underline those fleeting moments, ordinary moments, but somehow get elevated by that beautiful format. And it also adds gravitas, a seriousness to what's been represented. Using the process, it's not a, um, it's not a magic wand necessarily to producing great images. I still have to frame, compose, light, direct, and of course, these are manually focused moments. The way that it is, it's obviously a lot more uh, slower way of working. I think trying to work out the poetry um, that's in contained in these lenses, all these combinations of slight faults that perhaps you wouldn't see on modern lenses. When we see those faults, I think it reflects on the human condition and I think people can kind of pick up on that honesty 
Um, so I, fi I find the lens is um, quite honest. But I think there is a case of perhaps going too far with the anamorphic look. So I've always been keen to pare the look down a little bit, work with lenses that are perhaps less characterful, um, or certainly to stop down the lens a little bit to reduce some of that look. Um, if you look at the screen and you immediately, it screams anamorphic. Um, for me, I feel that I'm not doing my job. Thank you for your insights, Dick. You'll find a link to his website in the description. Scope Chapter 1 and 2 took you on quite a long journey and we hope that it will help you to shoot some awesome anamorphic footage or just fill some gaps in your knowledge. Please rewatch Scope Chapter 1 for a deeper insight about history, technology, lens design and fashion behind the format. We could tell you a lot about what we like and what we recommend in terms of lenses and other gear, but we will leave that to Scope Chapter 3. As we show throughout this episode, Scope Chapter 3 will have a lot about very specific subjects like taking lenses and bokeh design, diopters and how to achieve close focus on a budget, rigging anamorphic lenses and setup for simple solutions to experiments with anamorphic zooms, modding existent lenses to practical setups like with the Bell and Howell tested in this episode and designing flare characteristics, for example by adding glass or removing the coating from an element and by choosing a lens with a specific coating. All this will help you to get the image that you desire and hopefully prevent you from running into bigger surprises. We are already deep inside Chapter 3 and we will release that one in the nearer future. As a goodie for our members, Scope Chapter 3 will be released as a member exclusive first, so if you're after a new favorite scope or other material, that will give you a little head start. Our memberships start at just 99 cents with the Scott supported tier. Scope Chapter 3 will be released to the public two weeks after the member exclusive release. If you want a little bit more right now, why don't you watch the garage talk of the Atlas Orion guys right here on this channel. A lot of people may want to ask us questions personally by just dropping us a line, like it happened a lot after Scope Chapter 1 and the Canon FD episodes. To keep us sane and our kids fed, we can only give one by one consultation to our Kubrick members, which we really love to do, even in Zoom calls, if that's your thing. For the rest, there's our closed Facebook group where we try to answer your questions as good as possible for a larger audience. And if you just want to keep up with what we're cooking, follow us on Instagram. For this episode, we would like to end on some thoughts and a mantra. Many people that get into anamorphic are really after the obvious characteristics, especially the horizontal flares. Let us remind you that the most iconic anamorphic movies out there work without pushing them. And as Scope was Blade Runner themed, there are only very few scenes in the movie that show explicit horizontal flares. And while there are many scenes that could have been used to play with them, they never become fussy, forced or overwhelming. They're just there. As if there was no special attention put in them. I really have to say that I like that attitude. It is the counter-thesis to J.J. Abrams' inflationary use of flares. You hear a lot of the sharpness for this or that lens, but look at Rachel on the scene. The astigmatism of the anamorphic lens and the film itself renders the image so beautiful and soft, giving you just the right amount of detail. Enough for your fantasy to kick in, but not so much that it would demystify the scene. If we look at the image that one of our softer attachments produces on a vintage lens and we compare that to Rachel's previous scene, we kind of match the amount of detail. At something like 160% magnification. At 100% we exceed it by far. In focus but not sharp became a personal recipe for my approach to cinematography. For all our Blade Runner spoofs, we added significant amounts of Gaussian Blur and anamorphic lens blur in post. We would like to thank all of our partners and members that made this episode possible. First and foremost, The Marmalade and their team. The Marmalade is world famous for high-end tabletop work and beyond. Their spike motion control system opens up worlds for us. Thank you so much for collaborating with us. And here's the team of the Marmo. This is Niklas, he is the spike controller. This is Max, and this is Tom, and they did 
some behind the scenes. And thank you so much. Love you, boys. Great. Thank you. Very special thanks go to Max Hahn for helping out a lot with the scope episodes. Most of the behind the scenes footage was shot by him. By the way, this is shot with his spherical Lomus if you're interested. And he felt my smoky pain when we filmed the Brian scenes. Thanks again to Dirk Hagedorn for being our knight in shiny armor. Thank you Max from ExoOptics for fact checking our script and all the valuable input. Please check them out on Facebook and on Instagram for some extra cool gear and projects all around anamorphic. Thank you to Cine1 for generously supplying the Cine lenses for a test at no cost. If you want to rent anamorphic, please consider them. Link to their website is in the description. Thank you to our replicant friends, Dan and Forrest and the whole team from Atlas Lens Corp. Don't forget to watch the anamorphic garage talk that is released alongside this episode. John for his Atlas vs Baltar test. Chito for all the work he did in paving the way down the anamorphic DIY road for us and for everybody. Dick for some interesting insights in anamorphic photography. Thank you to Ridley Scott, whose visionary Blade Runner gave the scope episodes their theme and their soul. And thank you so much to our Kubrick members. You're the heart and the soul of this channel and you make it possible. Alexander Ulanov, Anders Egeskov, Andy Lin, Anthony Corbin, Antonio Garcia, Alex B. Bat, Brandon Kelly, CAG20, Chris Spratt Jones, Christos Tolis, Dolly Lamas T, Ed Haggerty, Ice Neckham, Emanuel Franca, Ethan Hegel, Eugenio Triana, Gordon Stepik Film Production, Gulbik Design DE, Giazi Sutton, H3FF01, J the Ginger, John Griffith, John Holt, Krasimir Knezovic, Loxley Lennox, Lucas Medreski, Magnitude, Malik Skabor, Mark David Strode, Maureen Cromary, Max K, Maximilian Willard, MG Kaplan, Michael Heidecker, Michael K, Michael Tabinka, Mick Lexington, Miguel Villa, Nathaniel Townsend, Niels Rosenkrantz, Nolan Putham, OGD2296, Orlando Art, P. Horton, Perry Strong, Peter Pavlots, Peter Polks, Premium Paris, Prentice Ryan Sneed, Prison Junkie, Raul Jill Jr., Raul Queris, Rio Jiang, RJ Permenter, Roger Ari Sheldon, Ryan Gines, Sebastian Rooks, Sergei Grebnev, Sergei Kotov, Skinny Kid, Srabble, Steve Welsh, Stephen Caban, Stephen Comeo, Tao Tao in NYC, The Woman That Doesn't Want to Be Named, Tim Knight, Tony Watimena, Colorist Filmmaker, Trevo PhD, Akrik Vanagosum, Vin Chandra, VS, Wolven Production, Yankip. Don't forget that Kubrick members get consultation. So if you want to do that in a one-on-one -on -one Zoom call and have us show you things, let us know. Of course, we love all our other members as well. Thank you so much for your support. Your action pack and special content awaits you. The division salutes you. This is Nicholas signing out with another delicious vision. Shoot something amazing.